Good morning. This is Chewing the Gristle with Tim Conroy and Al Black. This is a poetry chat. And today we're going to chat with the poet, John Lane. John is an environmentalist and educator. He was born in South, Southern Pines, North Carolina. He's an author of nearly a dozen books of essays, poetry, and nonfiction as well as the co-editor of five volumes of Nature Essays. In addition, he has uh, published several chapbooks and pamphlets of both poetry and prose. His poetry and essays and other short prose pieces have appeared in magazines and journals, both regionally and nationally. He earned his, M uh, his BA from Wolford College in 1977 and his MFA from Bennington College in 1995. Throughout the late 70s and in, into the 80s, he lived variously in the Pacific Northwest, Oklahoma, Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, working both in and out of academia. In the late 80s, he was invited back to Wolford to teach creative writing. He settled into this position and was eventually awarded tenure in 1999. A Wolford created environmental studies major in 2008. Lane is an avid kayaker and outdoorsman, and his love of nature and the wilderness infuses nearly every aspect of his writing and teaching. He has garnered numerous awards, and in 2014 was inducted into the South Carolina Academy of Authors. John, welcome. Great to be here, Al and Tim. Really appreciate y'all doing this. It's important work. John, you and were the you always interested in poetry, or did this interest develop later? Well, it um, it developed, blossomed, bloomed in high, in college um, through a creative writing class, the only one at my college, um, and I took it and um, got very interested in poetry, but. But I was in a bar once um, in Spartanburg, and an, a girlfriend from junior high school came up to me I hadn't seen in 30 years. And, and she said, I understand you're teaching now, and you're teaching poetry. Well, you were a poet way back when you were 14. I have a whole bunch of poems you wrote me that I still have from, from back then, and I had no memory of this. <laughs> so I must have been writing poetry when I was 14 and didn't know it. <laughs> I've never seen those poems, by the way, and I, I hope she keeps them to herself. <laughs> so, who are your poetry influences? Wow, um, it varied so dramatically through um, through time. Um, early on in college, I was pretty obsessed with a poet, a contemporary poet named Gregory Orr, um, and um, read him, read all the poets who were popular then, Dickey and James Wright and um, uh, um, Adrian Rich, um, Sylvia Plath, um, all those poets that young poets were reading then. And then I got really interested in um, a poet by the name of Theodore Retke um, and um, read a lot of those those poems and, and that. And then Robert Penn Warren and um, Robert Hass and Sharon Olds. I mean, the poets just keep keep rolling. Um, and um, I've always been a voracious reader. You know, everybody tells young poets that they've got to read in order to write. And, and, I, and I think that hasn't changed. I think that most of the young poets today who are, are good poets are still reading as much as we probably we all three did when we were in college. Um, my, my college um, librarian um, had way too much money to spend on contemporary poetry. And he told me way after he retired that that, that he would buy books, buy these volumes of contemporary poetry, knowing that I was probably going to be the only one to check them out. And um, Wofford's library still has way too much contemporary poetry from that period, probably because of my interest. Um, but I'm really appreciative to that old librarian who's passed now for um, using his budget to educate me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, you know, in terms of your process for writing, and your process for revision, can you talk um, to us a little bit about that and, and um, give some guidance to people about how you... Yeah, well, I, um, I'm, a, 
I'm an obsessive reviser. I'm going to reach over here and pull out a folder. Oh. Here we go. So I, um, I learned from Donald Hall, and even though I use computers now and I work with computers, um, I learned from Donald ha Hall this, this method. He was one of my mentors, and he said, um, start off and write a draft of a poem and then either just rip it off the, the, um, the page, I mean, the, the pad, or, um, or um, print it out, print out a first draft of it, and then, and then print it out and put it in the, um, put it in the folder as a first draft. And so this poem is, is a poem I wrote back in 2017 for an anthology um, called, um, um, it was an anthology about um, natural history poems about the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And so this poem, um, here's, the first, here's the first draft of it. I just, I just wrote, it, wrote it out and made one little change and I wrote it on there and then I came back and I printed a, a I print a um, clean copy, but here's a good example of my revision process. Um, just notice how many revisions there are there. Um, another clean copy goes in. That was, that was three days after I wrote the first draft. And then um, here's another one with, um, you guys might know that, know my friend Dino Trakas. Sure. Um, Dino Trakas is a poet. And I almost always show him drafts. And here are his notes on this same poem um, uh, about what he liked and what he didn't like. And so, um, so that's my process. I, my process is draft after draft after draft. Um, I usually put them in a folder, and um, they just go into this sort of file, file file cabinet that I have. Um, I really believe in this method because it it just it it dis disconnects you from this idea that a poet's first thought, best thought, immediacy, which I, I respect and admire Ginsburg's method, but it doesn't work as well for me because my first thoughts aren't always my best thoughts. Sometimes they are. There are poems that don't get revised very much at all, but often my poems are more like this one where I'll go through three, four, five, six drafts on a hard copy before I, before I send it out. Hey, John, especially when you were um, in the early years, mm -hmm. as you were developing your skill as a writer. Yeah. How'd you, how'd you deal with failure, rejection, um, sending it off? And Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a folder um, with hundreds of the early rejection slips that I received. I didn't throw them away. I, I kept them. Um, and I think I kept them because I wanted to be reminded of how hard it was and how hard it, and, and how hard it is now. I've discovered now that most of my poems that I'm publishing now are being published either by people who know me and ask me to be in their magazines or people ask me often to write poems for anthologies they're, they're editing. Um, that poem that I just showed you is called Timber Rattler. And, um, and it appeared in an anthology. And the reason I wrote it was because an editor wrote me and said, here's a bunch of um, animals that we're gonna include in this anthology of the University of Georgia Press, poems about animals. Choose an animal and write a poem about it. And so I didn't have to get rejected. I mean, they, they liked the poem once, once I'd written it. But um, you wouldn't, I mean, I, I, looked at my, um, I looked at my account the other day for submission um, that submission program they use now. And there was 25 rejections in there, poems I've sent out. And I mean, I'm, I'm 65 years old and I've, I've got five or six books of poems and um, I'm still getting tremendous rejections primarily because the, um, the taste has changed so much. Um, I've lived long enough where I've seen the ch taste change two or three times. And, um, and, and I've just kind of accepted that. And I, I'll probably continue to send poems out blindly, but I know that my chances of having a poem accepted blindly are probably a tenth of what they were when I was 25 years old um, because of the way taste has changed. You know, I, I appreciate that answer. And, and maybe uh, we can ask you to read a few poems. I just, uh, 
the reread your collect um, the old Rob poems, and when you were talking about um, writing, um, you know, you had a, a great poem about uh, rattlers uh, in that in this collection. Yeah, let me let me find that. Well, there's a Copperhead poem. Is that the yeah. one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, and you have yeah. a, a great poem about cicadas in that poem. Yeah, yeah, I'll read um I'll read the Luna Moth poem and the Copperhead poem. So let me great. tell you just a little bit about this collection. Um, this came out in 2014 from Thomas Raincrow's New Native Press. They did my collection back in um, 1990, 1994, I think, um, all of the um, Against the Information and Other Poems. And um, so I had these poems written about my place up in the mountains, and he released this limited edition, about 300 copies of this book. And the book is about a character named Old Rob, who's kind of a scene character. Um, he's an old guy living in the mountains, and he's got the old ways, but the new ways are pushing in on him. So here's the old, old and, and they're all, they all go, Old Rob does this, Old Rob does that. Old Rob kills a copperhead. With the snake's tail buzzing against dry leaves, Rob sets about clearing a copperhead from the yard. With hoe in hand, he creeps up as the grandkids watch from the porch. Up close, Rob admires the snake's poor, pure, cold attention, matching poisonous eyes, unblinking, eternal in their stare, a tongue like fire rolling out from this angel come back to draw all close to what they fear. Then the hoe comes down, cleaves head from the hourglass, Rob takes up the serpent's body with the crook and feeds it to the hogs. I always like that poem because it's kind of a cycle poem too, you know, that so many of my suburban um, friends who kill copperheads just put them in a plastic bag and put them out for the, <laughs> for the garbage man or, or just lay them in the street. And there's, there's this sense of Rob knows that this snake's going to be a little bit of protein for these hogs. Um, there was one more that, um, oh, cicadas. Tim, you mentioned this one, cicadas. And it's just about cicada season. So, old Rob listens to cicadas. They scrape the underside of the day, the hulks of their long sleep sloughed into the leaves of green summer oaks. They repent for this somnolence as inside the cabin, Rob sleeps while they prickle the shadows with their simple notes. They harry the dawn, then stop soon after. And during the day, their small springs wind back to silence as humidity fills the air. They cling to the backs of black limbs. And when the wind passes in the hollow, they sit silent and wait for dusk. John, I can't tell you how good that poem is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Brother Al. Um, so, yeah, that book was a very interesting book because I feel like I could walk through the country and, in that neighborhood, and if I met this guy, I'd know him. You know, I, I would know who he is. Yeah. Um, I wish he was still walking around up there. I was just up there last weekend and um, um, the ghost the ghost of old Rob is still around my place up there and I, mm -hmm. I'll sometimes sort of get a little hint of his shadow as I'm as I'm um, walking around our place mm. yes so a, as a poet how do your emotions and interests guide what you write and what kind of projects are you writing today? How do my emotions guide it? Um, you know, I think I always go back to, to Wordsworth for that idea of emotions recollected in tranquility. Um, I always know that there are emotions behind these poems, like those poems. I mean, there are emotions behind those poems, but the emotions don't drive them. They try to ground them. The emotions, I want, them to, I want the emotions to be grounded in, um, in images particularly, and in, in sounds, um, and I hope I did that with them. Um, I'm very emotional about snakes, 
I've written about snakes as much as just about any animal, and I love them. It would never occur to me to kill a copperhead, but nobody needs a tirade about me preaching about not killing snakes because I know most people do kill them. And, um, and so I, try, I tried to find, like in that poem, um, the, tried to ground the emotion of that poem in that, those images of those snakes. And that's what I try to do constantly is to ground those emotions. Um, it's really weird. Right now I'm working on two things. One thing Tim will maybe remember, um, his brother's 70th birthday party, we had all these wonderful panels, and Pat Conroy loved my poetry. <laughs> it meant just about as much to me as anything um, that, that's meant anything to me in my, my life as a writer. He once came into the bookstore in Spartanburg and said to Betsy, where are all John's poetry books? I want them all. And he went over there and he had one, but he bought everything else and he hauled them out of there and they're still somewhere. Um, now a few years, I don't know where, what happened to his poetry collection, but what is, what happened to it, Tim? Well, a lot of them um, are still in his, in his, you know, office in his bookcases. In fact, the last time I was sitting at his desk writing, you know the the poetry collection of your father yeah uh, yeah was was really close by on the shelf that yeah. meant something to him didn't it he put them close by <laughs> yeah and and so um so i'm working right now trying to shape up a long 45 page poem that i actually read at that 70th birthday party of pat conroy's um it's called um, um kingdom and glory it's a John Robinson Jeffers inspired long poem about the Packlet River flood of 1903. Um, and there are these two characters that are riding down this river in this church that's broken away and is going down this river, this flooded river and the bales um, coming back and forth like this. And, um, and they're, um, they're riding down this, this, um, this river in this church. And, I'm hoping I can get it finished this year. So that's what I'm hoping my next poetry collection will be, this 45-page poem about these two characters in this church riding down this river. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> and I've got a couple of prose projects that I'm working on. One's a memoir of my, my mother's family in Spartanburg County called The Gullies of My People. And another is a... John McPhee like book book length um, study of the Soil Conservation Service in Spartanburg County called Colluvium. <laughs> well, John, you know, Al's question kind of makes. Well, me I got a novel coming out. Uh, one more. I got a novel coming out in August from Mercer University Press. My second novel, and it's called "Whose Woods These Are." You'll recognize that line. <laughs> That's wonderful. So when does that come out? August. August? Yeah. You going to have a big release party? At I don't know. Um, the COVID stuff's messed everything up. I just got noticed today that that um, the Cater Book Festival's gone online. They're doing Zoom. They're not going to have a festival. And um, we'll just have to wait and see. You know, Spartanburg and South Carolina's numbers are spiking like crazy. So we have no idea what September's going to look like. You know, we may all be doing this forever. We don't know. <laughs> right. There may be no respite this year. You know, they talked about a, a respite during the um, yeah the summer, and it just may go right on through this it year. It could go, especially especially in the places that that are spiking now. There are 14 states that seem to be spiking. Well, let's let me ask you about in terms of your craft of writing poetry. Um, in terms of um, some of the poetic elements that you infuse into your poems, and, and um, you know, and maybe some advice to give to the emerging poet about those yeah. elements, and and you know, and, and, and you know, when you when you read the the two poems, um, you have such examples of of how you use sound, uh, yes, and in, in especially in the cicada poem, yeah. So beautifully. Thank you. Um, and so anyway, just, just speak to well, that. Well, I would say two things. I would say in my experience, and you guys might feel differently. I'd like to hear what you have to say. 
in my experience, sound is the hardest thing to teach. It's hard to teach a young writer how to, um, how to, um, let's see, let me get back to that poem. Taking too much time. Well, it's hard to teach. Oh, here it is. It's hard to teach young writers to to have an ear for scrape and side and long sleep sloughed green summer oaks. It's hard to teach that. It's almost like that sort of lyrical sound um, focus needs to come out of some natural um, perchance. You know, Gregory Orr had this whole theory that we have sensibilities. Each poet's given certain sensibilities. And some poets get a musical sensibility. Some poets get a metaphor sensibility. Some poets get a narrative sensibility. Um, some poets get an abstract sensibility for ideas. And that it's impossible, it's almost impossible to, to, um, um, to use more than two of those sensibilities in a poem and at one time, unless you're James Dickey or Shakespeare. <laughs> Uh, it's just almost impossible. And so it made me start thinking about, oh, and images, images and other sensibility. That, you know, one of my, I think that my two primary sensibilities that I, that I feel most comfortable with are definitely music and then maybe either metaphor or image. And music, it can't be taught, I don't think, but maybe it can. Maybe you guys feel differently you know, teaching the guitar or something. I was told that I, I would never learn to play the guitar by a guitar teacher because I just am not, my ear's not musical enough, but I can do this with, with a poem. So, but metaphor and image. One way to teach metaphor is, first of all, you got to teach somebody that got to learn what a metaphor is, one thing in terms of another. But after that, once you teach somebody to notice and to understand what a unique metaphor is. It's real easy to teach somebody on after a first draft to just mark through the metaphor they've got, which is often a cliche or what Donald Hall called a dead metaphor, like the linebacker plowed through the line. Plowing's a great metaphor, but linebackers, I mean fullbacks, fullback plowed through the line. Fullbacks have been plowing through the line for 45 years. The first person who said, who compared a fullback to a plow was making a metaphor that had action and, and, and power to it. The next person and the next person, and the next person, that becomes a dead metaphor. But if you mark through plow, and I'm not going to come up with something on the spur of the moment, um, but if you mark through plow and you say the, the fullback um, rotor rooted through the line, <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad metaphor, but but it's more lively than plowed <laughs> or rototilled through the line. Rototilled, rotorooter is another. <laughs> the fullback's a sewer suddenly and a <laughs> uh, 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 clogged drain. But 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 if you teach, you can teach a student to do that, to take their pen, take her pen and mark through plow and make a list of eight or 10 other possibilities and then choose the one that's the most exciting. You can teach that. And you can also teach it with images. You can also teach somebody what a, what a powerful image is. Um, green, here's, I mean, this is simple. This sounds almost Anglo-Saxon, but green summer oaks, that's not a metaphor. That's a descriptive image. Green summer oaks. Now, the, the young student, she might put, well, let's go one, but the leaves of green summer oaks, that's not a metaphor. That's a description. But the, 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 the young student, she might put trees, and it would read into trees or into the leaves of trees. That's kind of nice, actually, but it's not as nice as the leaves of green summer oaks. You can teach a student to notice that. And now, now teaching them to care enough to mark it out and to care and to make that list of, well, we've got a color there and we've got a season there and we've got a specific type. What's the difference in pines and oaks? You know, asking questions like that. So back to reiterate, 
I don't think you can teach sound very easily, but I do think you can teach a student to be, to somebody told me once to choose the second thing. Often in a first draft, you just get it down and just write that thing. But you go back and you always mark it out and you go, what's the next thing I could put there? It might be more surprising. You can teach that. You can teach those two things. Hey, hey John, would you read a few more poems for mm -hmm. us? All right. This is a little chat book. This is my first, um, my first British publication. This came out last year from a little press in London called Eyewear. And this was a little pamphlet series they did. And this is a group of poems I wrote called the Mad Kayaker Poems. Um, and I'm going to read one of those. Here we go. This is for where we are now. I'm going to read a political poem. <laughs> this is called The Mad Kayaker Votes His Values. This is a vote for the senator of Roaring Streams, the representative of Scree and Marmots, attending the high springs, for the alderman of many ripples following outward on still pools beside a flood-prone creek, for the pole master of plunging waters through the gorge, for the president of abandoned dams, floodplains, and migratory trout, for the councilman outside of something human who pauses on bridges and looks both ways, for the precinct chief waist deep in current who feels at home in the last district of the wild, the clear, the distant, the flowing free. I don't that's think I that um, after yesterday with the um, releasing us from the Wild Birds Act, I don't think that um, speaks very much to our current president or many politicians right now in office. But um, with this, I, this is a lot like the old Rob poems and then I created a character and then I, I wrote from them. Um, and then once again, another character in this book that came out um, in um, 2017, the Mad Kayaker poems came out in 18. Um, I create a, a character called the geologist and um, have the geologist speak to the current, um, the current, um, epoch, geologic epoch that we live in. And I'll read one from that. This one's a little longer. Is that okay? Yes. It's not going to go on for 15 minutes now, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the opening um, poem in the book. It's called The Geologist on Oyster Factory Road. And if anybody here is from Edisto or goes to Edisto, you'll know that the first draft of this poem was written there at Edisto, and then I gave it to this, this geologist. And it's another one, metaphor, sound, and image. I listen for the blue notes, an older assemblage, you know, blue crab old, or even lichen old, not mammalian, more like crickets chanting in the live oaks or the wind full of plaintive compositions. And what of pluff mud riddled with stalks of dead cord grass, a compendium drafted in a single seasonal supplication. In the chorus of caucusing herring gulls, I hear wood shedding, but I'm the block's new kid. Can't crash that circle of song, but I try anyway. I attend the formations of pelicans retreating to their distant sanctuaries. If they sing, it is only there keeping their own monkish council above the shale clacking bank and strand. An old man walks the beach with a red metal detector. His wife next to him carries a plastic bag full of black fossils picked from the tide's rack line. Like minor chords remaining from an aria scored a million years ago, and she's still listening. He doesn't care wearing big earphones, as if the sand is hip hop. I believe in words, but this morning, that fate may be misplaced, like looking for shark's teeth, how you scan the sand for a break in the pattern and not the tooth itself. Maybe you don't listen for the song either, 
maybe listening is like the way names remain on maps long after the thing itself. You see, my hobby is the least turn, splashing offshore, each dive a dart of song from a failing concert hall. If I listen closely, I will disappear, like the tide receding, or the tiny fiddler crabs, secure in their shallow holes. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one, one, one thing that I think your poetry has such a, a tone that invites the listener in. Um, I really try for that. Yeah, I really thank you for that because um, I've got a couple of friends who are postmodern contemporary poets and they work at a surface that doesn't invite people. And, and, and I've just never made that shift. I've just never made that shift to dropping the invitation. Although that's a complicated point. I mean, there's no doubt that's not no. William Carlos Williams simple. There's, there, there are these metaphors, these extended metaphors about time and birds and song um, that are layered. But I like to think that even though it's a complicated poem, you can listen to it and go, oh, yeah, I, I got that. I can get that. I mean, you have you have the elements of sound. You got just, just like you were talking about with the the images are so um, prevalent, and but also you have place, you have yes. character, yes, you have feeling, you have all of that in that poem. I try, I try, and I appreciate you hearing it and 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 unraveling it in that way, but also keeping it together as a full piece of cloth because. Um, as we know from Dead Poets Society, it's not always so good to unravel. <laughs> Literally. So we're getting towards the end of this, but who are you reading now? Who's informing John Lane, the poet, right now? All right, let me show you a book here. Um, look how big thick it is. So there's a, there's a um, Canadian poet that's not very no, well known in the United States, but he's rare. He's he's won all the major Canadian poetry awards. He's in his 70s. He lives in St. John's, in Newfoundland, and his name is Don Mackay. It's it's um it's spelled Mackay M A M C C A Y K A Y, but his name's Don Mackay, and he writes about geology and birds and um, and has a very, very playful um, mind. He loves puns and he loves, these poems are all about voice. And I discovered him about 12 years ago when I was in Canada and picked up a magazine in a bookstore, a famous Canadian magazine, poetry magazine, and he had a, they had a feature on him in there. And I have just, I can't stop reading him. And anybody who wants to just get a, get a real sample of him that you can listen to riding around in your car, go to iTunes and type in Don Mackay and birds. And he has a collection called Songs for the Songs of Birds that he has recorded um, bird songs and then somebody recorded him reading these poems. And you can download it as, a, as an iBook and listen to it in iTunes. And I listen to it all the time. Um, and so there's a lot of poets. There's Don Mackay. Um, I'm trying to think of, of oh, one more that, um, one more Canadian poet, Tim Lilburn. He's a very religious poet. He's um, a Buddhist and um, a monk, monkish, and and difficult. His poems are very difficult, but I'm, I really love, this was a book of essays, actually, of his, but I love dipping into Tim, Tim Lilburn and saying, can I get this? <laughs> um, I mean, because it is difficult poetry. And, and one more poet that I want to mention, um, gosh, let's see, who else have I got here? I love um, I'm another Canadian. I love this book. Um, John Steffler. 
This is a book that is a genre bending book. It's prose, as you can see here, it's poetry, but it's also, you know, prose. And I, I'm really, I really enjoy that now. This book, um, this book, um, the, um, an this Anthropocene Blues, it's got a lot of prose poems in it. And I really enjoy that bending the genre thing right now. John Steffler, this book is about an island um, off the coast of Newfoundland and his visiting this island. It's very um, um, dreamy, ghosty, but wonder, wonderful books. So three Canadian poets there that most people haven't heard of. John Steffler, Tim Lilburn, and my favorite, the great John M Don Mackay. Um, this book, um, Angular Unconformity, you could read the rest of your life. It's, it's just, that's his, it's his collected poems. And um, he, he is remarkable. <clears throat> Well, John, is that it? Yes, <laughs> but we want to thank you, and and uh, this has been a, a wonderful time. And and usually when we when we're done, it, we just want to ask so much more, but we we need to come to an end. And we we Tim and I really want to thank you. We want to encourage folks to check oh, out yeah. Up City Bookshop. Yes. Um, all of my books are available through Hub City Bookshop, even the Old Rob Poems, which is hard to get, and this one, which is hard to get. And definitely these, um, these, these two here, Anthropocene Blues, that's a Mercer University Press book, and then my selected poems, um, Abandoned Quarry, which won the um, SIBO the Award back in 2011 for the best book of poetry in the South. Um, those are all available from Hub City Bookshop, and they've got this thing now where you go online and you buy books from them, and they get major credit for them um, in a way that, you know, allows them to keep going. We need to really help our bookshops right now. You know, my books are available in other places, but I don't like to talk about them, those places that we don't mention, you know. <laughs> and we, 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 we fully understand that. Yeah. Uh, again, for... Um, Doing the gristle, we want to thank you for this poetry chat, and have a great day. Oh, thank you. It's really great being here, and I can't wait to do that Scottish program, Chewing the Thistle. <laughs>